Hello! Welcome to lesson number five in our series of 13 lessons on the precious Word of God. In today's lesson, we're going to be trying to answer the question, does sin exist? And if so, who can save us from those sins? To begin our study, we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So if you'd like to be turning to Isaiah 12, 1 through 3, we'll begin our study in just one moment. Please keep in mind, in all of these studies, what we're trying to do is simply explain what the Bible teaches in response to, to many different questions that we as individuals have and mankind as a whole has asked over the ages. Today we're asking the question, is there really such a thing as sin? And if there is, who can save us from those sins? We've already asked several questions. We've asked, uh, for example, is there a God? And if so, who is that God? We've asked, are we created? And if so, who is our creator? We've asked, is there such a thing as the Messiah? And if so, who is that Messiah? We've asked different questions like that. Some of the questions we'll be asking as the series continues is, why is there evil in this world? Is there an afterlife? What's the true meaning to life? How can I find true happiness and joy? We have many questions to go yet. But in each and every case, we're going to find that the Bible gives us an answer to these questions. The whole purpose of this series is to point out that without the Bible, we have many of life's questions remaining unanswered. But with the Bible, we can answer many of life's most difficult questions. For that reason alone, we should be holding the Bible as very precious. We should be holding up the Bible as a rule, as a standard that we should be following with our life. And so by the end of our series, I'm hoping that all of us will maybe have a little greater appreciation for God's Word and all the information and all the knowledge that it gives to us. And keep in mind, one of the factors behind the idea that we can have all of our questions answered through the Bible is this. It is the very Word of God. That's why it contains the answers to some of life's most difficult questions that men can't answer. It's because God's the one that's doing the answering. It's not a man. It's not just a series of men who wrote the Bible, but God himself wrote the Bible. That's why it can give us answers to some questions that mankind just cannot answer on their own. Okay, to begin our study today of, is there sin? And if so, how can we be saved from that sin? Let's look at Isaiah 12, verses 1 through 3. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Okay, what do we find here? Here we find in Isaiah 12 that first of all, Isaiah is acknowledging the Lord was angry with him. He says, Lord, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. Look, Isaiah recognized the fact that he displeased the Lord with his life. Isaiah recognizes the fact that he's not a perfect individual. There were times when he has sinned against God, and because of that, God's anger is turned toward him. But also, if you notice, Isaiah recognizes there is a way to have God's anger turned away. He said, Thou wast angry with me, that's past tense, Thine anger is turned away. He's saying, I did receive forgiveness. You are no longer angry with me, even though you previously were angry with me. Okay, how did that happen, Isaiah? How did God's anger get turned away after you had failed him and committed sin? He goes on and says, Behold, God is my salvation. In him will I trust and not be afraid. Right there he said it. He said, it's because I was able to be saved from God's wrath. I was able to be saved from God's anger, and that salvation came from God. He said, God is my salvation. 
So just in these few verses, we've had a lot that, that we can come to an understanding of our original question. Yes, we've sinned. But yes, there is such a thing as salvation from that sin. And we've also find here that God is the one that saves us from those sins. He goes on then, I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and song. Which God is it that gives us salvation? Which God is it that enables us to have his wrath turned away from us even though we've sinned? Jehovah God. That's the God that Isaiah is talking about in the context here. So the very same God that is a true God over all, the very same God that is our creator, the very same God who anointed Jesus to be the true Messiah is the very same God that supplies salvation to his people. He goes on finally and says, Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. There Isaiah makes it plain that it's the same God that saves. He's the same God then that gives us joy. Joy knowing that we're forgiven. Joy knowing that it is through his work that we can find the forgiveness of our sins and live a joyful life in him. In Isaiah 45 and in verses 20 through 22, we can continue our study. In Isaiah 45, 20 through 22, listen to this. Assemble yourselves and come and draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge to set up wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Folks, please understand. The God Jehovah is the only one that can give us salvation from our sins. It is only through Jehovah that we can find true forgiveness and peace. Here Isaiah is saying, you know what? There are other nations back in those days that were worshiping other gods. It was wasted, futile effort. Why? Because those other gods could not save. But it is only through the Lord Jehovah alone that we can find true salvation from our sins. He goes on in these verses and says, They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? Jehovah says, Look, all of these men that are worshiping other gods, they're going against what I've clearly revealed to me. And I've revealed clearly that Jehovah is the true God. I have revealed clearly that it is through Jehovah that we find true salvation and Jehovah alone. We have these other men in these other nations that are turning to other gods in the hopes of finding salvation. But what do we find here? wasted effort he says I've made it plain to everyone that I am the true God please come to me and be saved and yet the other nations turn from Jehovah to other gods seeking salvation in those who cannot save he goes on there is no God else beside me a just God and a savior there is none beside me. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Folks, do you see now why, I guess it was lesson two in this series on is there a true God? Do you see why that's so important now? Now we're getting down to brass tacks. Why is it so important that we recognize who the true God is? Because the one that is the true God is the one that is the Savior of man. For us to know who to look to for salvation, we have to recognize who the true God is. We've already studied the true God is Jehovah, and now we have it affirmed to us that it's through Jehovah that we find true salvation. It is only through him that we can find salvation, not through the other gods of this world. If you would turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. This is a very interesting verse because here we find salvation being talked about. And here we find that not only is Jehovah God our Savior, but also the Lord Jesus Christ has a role in our salvation as well. Listen to what's said. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, now listen to this. By the commandment of God our Savior. So there he's saying Jehovah is our Savior. But he goes on. And the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now here Paul is giving us two different persons of the Godhead 
describing them in similar ways. He says, first of all, for God the Father, God the Father is our salvation. But then concerning God the Son, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. Why do we say that Christ is our hope if in God we find salvation? It's because the saving work of God is based upon the saving work of Christ. God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to the earth to live a sinless life, to be a sinless sacrifice on the cross, to die in our place so that we might find forgiveness of our sins. So yes, it is through God that we find salvation, but yes, it is through Christ that really our hope lies. Because our hope lies in the work of Christ and what he did on our behalf. So Paul here makes it plain that yes, Jehovah is our Savior. And Christ, being Jehovah, is the one that died on the cross for our sins. Again, I ask, remember some previous studies. We've seen how Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. He said, I and my Father are one. The word Je Jesus, if you remember, means Jehovah is our salvation. So Jesus is Jehovah God, the second person of the Godhead, dying on the cross so that God's people might be saved. That's why Jesus is described as our hope. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 1, 21 through 23. Here we have it brought out clearly that in God's plan to save his people, Jesus Christ was the one that he chose to use. She shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Remember, this is an angel speaking to Joseph. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The angel made it plain to Joseph that the son that Mary was to bear would be Jesus Christ. He would be named Jesus for a purpose. Because he would be the one that would save his people from their sins. And so therefore we find what? Jesus, Jehovah our Savior, is the one that was chosen by God to bring salvation to his people. So folks, yes, sin exists. And yes, as fallen mankind, we must find forgiveness of those sins. Yes, salvation is found only through Jehovah, the true God. And yes, that salvation is based on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah himself, who came to the earth and died on the cross for our sins. What a wonderful truth it is to learn that salvation is through Jehovah God in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you see what we would be missing if we did not have the precious word of God? Where else could we find the truth about salvation and how we can find salvation from our sins? Let's go on. Uh, here in Matthew 1, 22, now this, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Do you see how the Bible is constantly reaffirming several truths? Constantly reaffirms that Jehovah is the true God. Constantly reaffirms to us that Jesus is God himself come in the flesh. Constantly confirming to us that it is only through Jehovah, the work of Jesus on the earth, that we can find true salvation. Constantly reaffirming that. And here we find the angel giving this prophecy <clears throat> about Christ being called Jesus and then by seeing this prophecy about being born of a virgin all of this was promises that God had made that he would send a savior to the world that he would send his Messiah to the world and we find Jesus was the fulfillment of those prophecies as he came as the anointed one of God to save God's people from their sins. If you turn with me please to John 1, 29-34. John 1, 29-34. Folks, yes there is sin and sin does exist. That's why the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin exists. But it is in Jesus Christ in Jehovah God that we find salvation. Listen to John 1, 29-34. Here we find John the Baptist. 
<clears throat> speaking to his followers. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was pointing his followers to Jesus. He was pointing out Christ as the Son of God that takes away the sin of the world. I'm sorry, the Lamb of God, meaning what? He was the one who gave his life sacrificially, just like the lambs that were slain in the Old Testament. It would be this Jesus that would give his life so that we might be saved. He said, Behold! In other words, set your eyes upon him. You can see him right there. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After he cometh, a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I am come baptizing with water. Keep in mind, a part of why Christ was baptized was to declare to everyone he was the promised Messiah. Because what took place at his baptism? The Spirit came down upon him as a dove and lighted upon him. That was God the Father anointing Christ with the Spirit. And so it was at the baptism of John the Baptist that we have Jesus clearly being declared as the anointed one of God because they actually saw the Spirit come down upon Jesus as God the Father anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. And prove to them, he is the anointed one of God. He goes on, John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but that he sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So you can see, John himself is declaring, when I baptized Jesus Christ, that was proof to me he was the Messiah. It was proof to me he was the anointed one of God. It was proof to me he was the very Son of God, being God in the flesh, Jehovah in the flesh, Jehovah our salvation. So it was through the baptism of John the Baptist that we find a validation of the claims of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself, and the Savior of the world. All of those things were clearly shown to everyone when John the Baptist baptized Christ and then the Spirit came from God the Father and landed upon Christ in the form of a dove. So folks, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, being the Savior of mankind. You might ask, well, how can we say he's the Savior of man? It's because he is Jehovah himself, the true God, our Creator, who can save us from our sins. He and he alone can save us from the sins that we committed. Listen to Titus 2, 11 through 14, and we'll close with this section of scripture. Titus 2, 11 through 14, excuse me. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. As we close this lesson, I would like to address believers only now. Okay, up to this point in time, the lesson can be applied to the lives of both believers and unbelievers. But this last portion of scripture was written specifically to believers. If you notice, in this section of scripture, we do find Jesus being mentioned, given the titles of great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So once again, we're having affirmed to us that Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ is the Savior who can save us from our sins. But what I want us to know is the greater context of this thing. In verses 11 through 14, we find the argument that as Christians 
who have been forgiven of our sins by God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ, we must live godly lives for him. Now let's listen to what's said. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay, so what's being said there is this. God has saved us by his grace. God has given us the wonderful gift of salvation, even when we did not deserve it. So by grace now he brings salvation. It is that grace that appears to all men, meaning men of every nationality. So for us to say only Jews can be saved, that's not so. For us to say only Americans can be saved, that's not so. For us to say only Chinese people can be saved, that's not so. God's gracious salvation has appeared to all men. So we know that there is nobody excluded from salvation. Men can be saved. Women can be saved. Adults can be saved. Children can be saved. Employers can be saved. Employees can be saved. Presidents can be saved. Paupers can be saved. Rich men can be saved. Poor men can be saved. You know, you can go on and on and on. All the different types of people that live, whether it's nationality-wise, whether it's gender, whether it's financial status, whether it's social status, whether it's political status, however you want to break up mankind, salvation has appeared to all men. There is no group excluded from salvation if they will only turn to Christ and believe. So the grace of God in salvation has appeared to all men, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world. Okay, now. As Christians, once we've been saved, we need to deny ungodly and worldly lust. Now, remember, we're talking about the context here. Is there sin? And if so, who saves us from sin? Remember, salvation from sin is not simply God saving us from the penalty of sin. Salvation also involves God saving us from the power of sin. So as Christians, once we are saved... We should be constantly fighting temptation in our life. We should be seeking to glorify the Lord in our lives by obeying his commands and wanting to fulfill his desires for our life. God does not desire for us to sin. So, what we need to do as Christians is this. We need to deny ungodly and worldly lusts. We need to live soberly, righteous, godly in this present world. Why? Because we know someday he's coming back to take us home to be with him. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Reason number one to live godly lives as Christians, we know he's coming again. Reason number two, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purity unto himself. A peculiar people. The second reason why we should live godly lives as Christians is because he died for us. And one of the purposes why he died for us wasn't simply to save us from the penalty of sin. In other words, eternity in the lake of fire. That's not the only reason why he saved us was to save us from that. But he saved us so that we might be peculiar people set apart for his use. He saved us so that we would lead godly lives and to live lives that glorify him. So that's the second reason why we should strive to lead, lead, lead godly lives for him. And thirdly, zealous of good works. The third reason why we should live godly lives for him is because he is zealous of good works. He has a hot desire to see good works in our life. So folks, why as Christians do we live godly lives? We know he's coming back. We know he died to save us, and one of the purposes of that salvation was so that we would live godly lives, and finally, because he has a great desire for us to live godly lives. Those are the three great reasons why, as Christians, our salvation shouldn't simply be salvation from God's wrath, but it should be salvation from the power of sin in our lives. Okay, again, I want to thank you very much for joining me in this lesson. Next week's lesson will be, we'll be asking the question, where do we turn to find true peace and comfort? 
in the midst of a world that is filled with injustice, pain, and suffering? Okay, we'll answer that question, Lord willing, in our next lesson. Lord bless you as you study his word. Until next time.